Welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast, where we address the challenges and the opportunities of midlife from a uniquely Catholic perspective. This is the time, my friends, for a deeper renewal of your Christian vocation. Come and enter into the freedom of Christ that allows you to be the person you were created to be, because there's an amazing, awesome, exciting next season of life waiting for you. Hello, and welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast. I'm Karen Herbert, and I'm here with my co-host, Curtis. Hey, everybody. It's lovely to be with you here today. And Curtis, I'm wondering if we have any listener comments. Well, a listener in our Facebook group okay. did comment, said that there are some good theology books on suffering, but it is a mystery. Maybe some do suffer purgatory on earth, like the old saying. Excellent point. So this is a comment on our previous episode. Yeah, responding to the present season that we're doing on dun, 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 suffering. Yay! Woohoo! Aren't you excited <laughs> to be listening? Yeah. <laughs> Karen, welcome back from Houston, where you were at a theological conference on Acts. What was. What did you learn for our listeners? What's oh. What's a nugget for us? Okay. Well, it was a wonderful conference and just unpacking the book of Acts and and all of the beautiful themes and layers of meaning in the book of Acts. Something really interesting that I had never heard before. It's about the very beginning of Acts when Luke is saying, hey, Theophilus, my reader slash listener, you've read, you're familiar with what I've already written about the acts and the deeds and the sayings and the work of Jesus. And he's referring, obviously, to the Gospel of Luke, which Luke had previously written and was obviously well known in the Christian communities at this time. And part of what Luke is saying is, so I've told you what Jesus began to do and teach. And he doesn't explicitly say this, but in the mind of the listener, they would have heard this. And now... I'm giving you the sequel about the things that Jesus continued to do and teach in and through the early Christian communities and the followers of Jesus. And the scholar who was giving the conference said, you know, in many ways we call this the acts of the apostles, but it really is kind of like the acts of King Jesus part two, because there's central idea that the Holy Spirit working to bring the gospel to the world in and through the followers of Jesus, this really is the work of King Jesus to continue to implement and bring about his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And that's the purpose of this whole story is to show how the gospel is coming to bring the news about this amazing, wonderful kingdom to even the ends of the earth. So Luke, the gospel of Luke is, hey, folks, here's the gospel. And now Luke writes Acts, and he says, hey, folks, here's the gospel in action. Yes, that's an excellent way of putting it. What does it look like when it starts to dig in and get going and implement itself in the world. So it's more than a history of what Paul was doing in the world. It's it's a narrative, it's a story, it's an explanation of, hey, this is what happens when you bring the gospel into the world. This is what it looks like. Yes, exactly. And that's how it connects to this element of suffering and difficulty and challenges you could see all throughout Acts that where the glory of God comes and where the gospel comes, there is difficulty and there is suffering and these things will go together. Right. So the gospel is going out into the world. It's being recorded in the book of Acts. There's a real shortage of parades and parties <laughs> yeah, and big sure. get togethers and adoring fans. And when that happens, it makes everybody really nervous because <laughs> somebody doesn't understand it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So this is our big point and that we've been making for a while now, and that is that when our life in Christ or when the gospel 
comes down into this present age, that would be the world around us, you have these pain points and, and suffering happens there. Yes. And, and here's a great story from Acts that really makes that point. It's from the end of Acts when Paul is sailing from Jerusalem to Rome and, and he gets on this ship and it, it's, it really made me laugh at what it made me think about was that reality TV show, The Ice Road Truckers. <laughs> that a friend introduced me to because here Paul is headed to Rome where he wants to go. And he's on this ship and he's got the ship captain and she's got these businessmen with their cargo. And they're like, well, technically it's past the season. Technically, yeah, it's a little bit risky to make this trip. But, but it's not too risky for the ice road truckers. Exactly. I don't care if I could only see four feet <laughs> in front of my grill of my monster truck. I'm just going to go pound down the highway. What could possibly go wrong? We're doing it because there's people in Rome who don't have enough to eat and we're getting our stuff there. And of course, they're going to pay me a lot of money to do it. <laughs> go figure. So here they are at the end of the season taking off and... Paul's not very surprised that this enormous storm comes up. One of the things, again, that I did not appreciate about the book of Acts is how many parallels there are to Luke's gospel. And Luke would have really just assumed that his hearers would hear the parallels between these two works. So, for example, Jesus in the gospel goes on a journey and arrives in Jerusalem. So does Paul. Jesus was picked up by the Jewish authorities and handed over to the Romans. So was Paul. Jesus was interrogated by the Roman governor, who at one point brought him before Herod Antipas. Paul was also interrogated by two Roman governors and brought before Herod Agrippa, and so on. Now, of course, Jesus went to his death, whereas Paul was sent to Rome. But he's sent to Rome via the sea. And the sea in the Jewish worldview had a very specific role. The Jews were really not seafarers. And in their cosmology, the sea, although God had made it, as he made everything else, and it was his, at the same time, the sea was this dark force. It, it was portrayed as a place from which monsters come, as its own kind of power of chaos. This is a part of what is meant in a Exodus and comes into play, and why it's so amazing that God parts the Red Sea for his people. And it's in Daniel where the monsters are coming up out of the sea. So part of what Luke is saying here is Paul's going to Rome, but first he has to go through the sea and experience the kind of suffering that goes with being a follower of Jesus because the gospel is implemented using the same means that Jesus won his victory, which is through the suffering and the ultimate salvation. The suffering is flowing from this encounter between, however you want to say it, uh, the new creation and the world, or the gospel and the world, or the life of Christ and the world. Now, let's talk about some other perspectives on suffering. Are you game for that? Yeah, sure. And these come from... Well, things I've been reading, but maybe more from conversations. And there's this idea out there that, well, God has kind of chosen some suffering for me in advance, and he's bringing it to me because he needs me to whatever, to grow or to pay a price or to participate in suffering. And so he's willing the suffering for me. What do you think about that perspective? Well, I'm kind of curious, Curtis, what you think about it. I I'm, I'm hearing that there's something problematic in that for you, or it doesn't quite sit right. 
I'm not sure exactly what bothers me so much about it, Karen. I, I think part of it is it, it smells like this penal substitution theory, which Catholics don't go for, but it's so prevalent. This idea is that God punished Christ to so that God could achieve perfect justice. And it's all about the punishment so we can have salvation. And we internalize these things as God's punishing me because that's how God works. He punishes his son to achieve perfect justice. Now he's got to punish me too. Yeah. So it's almost like the idea that God is behind it is the the cause or the reason. And not example. only is God behind it, but he's got this, this will for it. He's gathering up the forces of suffering and dishing them out according to some secret formula. Yeah, so I just need to take my medicine so that I can have some kind of outcome. I can learn something. I can be a better person. I can get to be a better Christian. I can love more. And this is the kind of the medicine I need to take. Yeah, the medicine. Suffering is God's medicine. Yeah. That also sits wrong with me, Curtis. And part of it, part of it gets at this. I think we talked about it last week, actually, the difference between trying to find a reason for suffering and discovering purpose in suffering. And those are not the same things. And the story that's coming to mind for me is I gave a retreat once and I was talking about actually this very concept that sometimes we say God is willing this suffering for me in a kind of a common sentence is, well, God's trying to teach me something, something I have to learn in this. And I was explaining that the suffering does not come from God. And yet, when we accept and enter into the suffering, we can meet Christ there. And God's purposes can be achieved regardless of the difficulty or challenge or suffering that's there. And one of the retreat participants, after we had gone to have our prayer time, came back and said, that she had had this enormous challenge in her life. And she was thinking about it in terms of, well, God's trying to teach me something. There's something I need to learn here so that I can be, and she probably would have even used the language, be transformed or what have you. But the energy that she was bringing when she said that, it was just so, it was this very low energy. It was, it was kind of helpless and powerless. And it's almost like, I'm the victim here. And in her prayer, she said, that's not what God showed me. God showed me Jesus standing by my side as my protector, my guide, my hero, as we're facing together this reality in life. And it was this big shift in perspective. And that's more the perspective that I see in the scriptures and in the Christian life is God is with us in the suffering and he's continuing to work his purposes. He's continuing to build the kingdom. He's continuing to spread the gospel. And we don't always see how that's all going to work out, but God is by my side. I can meet Christ in there as I really am implementing his kingdom in the world. That's a beautiful image, Christ standing by her side yes. with the sword. And he, you know, he's the one that knows what suffering is all about. He's the one that suffers and he, he's meeting her there. He's on her side and they're doing the necessary. Yes. And, and, to, and encountering this thing. And what a difference that made. In, instead of it's time for me to just suffer, it's because I have some kind of price to pay. And, and this attitude, it goes, it goes very deep. I'm talking to these men and 
They're just convinced I have to punish myself so I can achieve more and do better. It's almost that idea that God punishes us so we can learn. It's, I didn't clean my room. So yeah. now I'm in big trouble. I'm going to suffer until I learn. Keep your room clean. Part of the reasons, Curtis, why I think those ideas are so compelling for us is we we seek the reason for this inexplicable, mysterious suffering in our life. And we want to know, it goes back to that why question. We want to know why. And if we can say, oh, it's so that I can learn something. Oh, it's so that I can be made holy. Oh, it's so that this will happen or that will happen. Finding the reason makes us feel better. And it's almost like if we can embrace a reason, then we can accept the reality of the suffering. And actually, I think it's supposed to go the other way around. We are meant to enter into that story of suffering. We're meant to enter into the glory of the kingdom. And in the process, we are going to discover purpose. And the acceptance comes first. The acceptance of the reality of being in the kingdom in this present world is first. And then there's an opening to meet Christ and experience the purpose that he can bring out of anything. Acceptance is so crucial. It's really a life skill. It's a survival skill. We have to, as we resist things, we just make them worse. We suffer more. We we often think, well, this shouldn't be happening to me. And it doesn't help us until because what's needed is for us to realize, okay, this is happening and God's allowing this to happen, but he's on my side. And then you can start to respond to that. So that's the acceptance piece. So getting to acceptance first is, well, it's so very helpful. I think accepting without reasons is extremely difficult. And in many ways, it, it goes against our our natural inclination to want to nail down all all of the things and have it fit together logically in our brain. Yeah, our our brain does seek logical, tidy, close ended answers. That's our left hemisphere of our brain. It's it wants to have a reason and explanation, and then it says okay, now we can go on because I understand this. Yeah. It's almost like it doesn't even matter if it's true or accurate explanation as long as we have one that makes sense and fits for us. Well, one of the traps there is often as soon as we have a quote-unquote reason, then we put we put it all behind us and we miss out on the purpose and the growth and the possibilities in the situation. So say that you're a salesperson and you go out and the, you don't get the sale and you look back on that call and you say, well, my shoes were really dirty that day. I had kind of a situation and my shoes weren't clean. Then, then you, that's it. You're not learning anything else from that situation. Interesting. So it's like, finding the reason kind of closes the loop and and actually cuts you off from the deeper kind of growth and learning that could come in the midst of that process. Right. It's just, it could be a trap. That's all. Yeah. So I'm suffering because, well, I have to carry my cross. And if, you know, I don't suffer this cross, well, it's just going to be some other cross. So there's really no reason, frankly, in dealing with this one particularly. It's just a, this is a good one to suffer with. So I'll roll with this one. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm hoping that our listeners are, are hearing some things in here that are interesting. I, I hope you guys that, that it's making you think a little bit because it's a little bit nuanced what we're saying, the difference between finding reasons and discovering 
purpose. But I think it's very important because it is extremely uncomfortable. It is extremely uncomfortable to stand in the place of the mystery and not have the answers and lean in and engage and seek God in the midst of that thing and God's purposes. It is an extremely uncomfortable. It's like being on a tightrope over an abyss. And in, in fact, some theologians describe hope precisely in that way is there's all of this unknown and you are just open wide over the unknown, but you have your eyes fixed on the person who is guiding you and therein you find your hope to keep going. And, and there's something about that unknown and uncomfortability that we want to run away from and yet is so key to allowing the purposes of God to shine forth. I want to return to that story that you shared and yeah. really illustrates how important this is to, mm-hmm. to be able to accept the suffering and then find Christ at your side instead of looking for all these quote unquote answers to the why. Yeah. So, so it's actually, it actually parallels pretty well, Paul on that ship in the middle of the storm. He's, he's got his eyes fixed on Christ and he could come up with a ton of reasons why he's in that situation, right? Oh, it's because the ship captain is an idiot and the businessmen didn't listen to me when I told them that this was a bad idea and we really shouldn't be heading out to sea at this point. Or he could look at it from backwards and say, once they were on the island of Malta, oh, well, here's the reason that God was behind this because now I've been able to heal these people on Malta and probably also preach the gospel to them and and think of all of these works that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't have gotten shipwrecked. So so that's a reason. But really what the book of Acts and Luke is telling us is when you go to serve the Lord, however that looks like for you, when you're a Christian, when you have the Holy Spirit, when you've committed your loyalty to Christ, the powers that be right now in the world will come against you. And you can expect it to be a way of suffering. And we know that because we're followers of Jesus and we know that his way was a way of suffering. And yet the purposes of God are going to take that and work through that no matter what, as long as we're clinging to him in the midst of the storm and praying and breaking bread as Paul was on that ship. And for Paul in those situations, God drew many purposes out of those circumstances. Yes. If there were people on Malta, maybe some of his purpose was for them to hear the gospel. And God is always bringing purpose and good out of all our circumstances. He's sweeping it up into his cosmic plan. He really is. And we're standing there in the midst of it, seeking to align ourselves with his purposes on his behalf, because we're part of his kingdom. And we're creating a a generation of listeners that are going to use the word cosmic in their vocabulary. Ah, I see what you are doing now. Yes. You're like, once per episode, we must say cosmic. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. So my friends... If you are in the middle of the storm, it does not mean you're doing anything wrong. It doesn't mean the journey is futile. It simply means Jesus is claiming the world as his own and the powers of the world are going to do their best to resist. And you don't need to seek reasons. Simply recognize the mark of the cross for what it is and claim the victory 
already won in the unique cosmic work of Christ on Calvary. And do not be afraid. That's beautiful, Karen, and cosmic. And my listener friends, do not be afraid to email us at thecatholicmidlife at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your thoughts, opinions, perspectives, what's inspiring you, and what's making you suffer now. Let us know. We would love to hear you. It's great to be here with you. See you next week. Thanks for being here with us. The Catholic Midlife Podcast is for anyone that wants to receive the abundance of life that God has for each one of us. Take a moment right now to tell a friend about us.